Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 LendFest News Philanthropy Summit. I'm Annie McCain Madonia, and we're so glad that you're joining us this morning. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jim Friedlich, who will be leading our keynote conversation with Dr. Keith Leapart in just a minute. But I first wanted to give you a preview of what to expect over these two days and a few rules of the road. We have a packed schedule of workshops, discussions, and networking events, and you can find the full schedule in the sessions tab at the top of the screen in the Zoom events lobby. As a reminder, everyone who is attending the summit has agreed to abide by our event principles, which are based on respect and creating a brave space that allows us all to learn together. If you have any concerns or questions throughout the summit, there'll be a Lenfest Institute staff member in each session who can direct, you can direct message on Slack or you can email events at lenfestinstitute.org. That inbox will be monitored throughout the two days. We'll have time in each conversation to take questions, so please use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom screen to share your questions with the speakers. Most of the sessions will be recorded, so you'll be able to catch up on anything you miss. Closed captioning is also available and can be turned on by clicking the button labeled CC Show Captions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please use the hashtag NewsPhilSummit if you'd like to post about the summit on Twitter or other platforms. And finally, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who's made the summit possible. Our incredible team has been working tirelessly behind the scenes for months to organize the summit, from putting out a call for proposals to testing the technology they thought of it all. A very special thank you to Yossi Lichterman, Ali Vanier, Haley Slusser, Anna Gordover, and Joe M. Didas and the Center for Cooperative Media, who have been terrific partners on this summit. A very special thank you to Terry Quinn of the Texas Tribune and Rebecca Foreman of the Lenfest Institute for being there before we even started and continuing to be amazing partners in this work. And of course, to Jim Friedlich, our executive director, who's been an advocate and champion of this work from the very beginning. Thank you also to our colleagues at the Lenfest Institute for supporting this work, especially Samaya Green, Charles Jun, Jeff Muckensturm, Sean Mooring, Amy Kovac, Ashley, and Ken Hertz. Thank you, thank you to all the speakers and panelists who volunteered to share their time and their expertise with this community. And finally, thank you to all of you for joining us this week and truly making this a community. The Lenfest News Philanthropy Network grew out of a gathering we held in Philadelphia way back in 2019 with about 30 people in our offices. And there are now more than 2000 members of the network from around the world. We're pleased to be part of a movement together to make philanthropy part of a sustainable business model for news organizations. I'd like to take a moment to just pause and think about this and why we do what we do. These past weeks have been filled with anger and pain over yet another senseless murder. Please join me today in a quiet moment of reflection to support and honor all those who feel and live the trauma of these heinous crimes and our colleagues, especially those in Memphis right now, who every day are putting themselves at the center of this work. Thank you. It's another reminder about the value of local news that elevates community voices and holds power to account. We are filling a most vital, vital role and our news organizations can't do it without you, without us. No money, no mission. And it's not always easy to raise money. We are stretched too thin. Our colleagues don't understand what we do sometimes and how hard it is, even worse, sometimes they refuse to help. We face rejection all the time. And no matter how much we raise, it's never enough. And yet, and yet working with donors is a very special close partnership. Working with people and funders who believe in our work and our mission, who are willing to give up their resources and usually expect nothing back. And you are helping them do something so meaningful and important with their lives. People say fundraising is hard and it is. It takes perseverance and a willingness to put yourself out there. But there's also a very special beauty to it. You're providing an opportunity to people who want to contribute and make our communities stronger. I truly believe that we're going to look back on this time in a few years and realize that together 
we've created a whole new field of work for local news and have helped to sustain local journalism at a time of profound need. So now on to our keynote. We're so thrilled that our own Jim Friedlich and Dr. Keith Leapart, founder of Philanthropy with an I, are launching our summit on transformation with a keynote session on democratizing philanthropy. For those of you who don't know Jim, he's the executive director and CEO of the Lenfest Institute for Journalism and has spent his career in journalism and media, building, examining, and supporting business model innovations in media and news across the country. Dr. Keith Leapart is an innovator whose expansive and parallel careers in medicine, business, and philanthropy center upon one single mission, to help as many people as possible, as often as possible. In 2018, Keith launched Philanthropy, an innovative digital and social engagement platform designed to amplify awareness, excitement, and commitment to lifelong philanthropy. Philanthropy, with an eye, is transforming charitable giving for people of all ages by highlighting everyday gifts of time, talent, and treasure. Keith is the chair of the board of the Lenfest Foundation here in Philadelphia and a member of the boards of both the Lenfest Institute and the Philadelphia Inquirer, as well as many others. In addition to his philanthropic and business responsibility, Keith maintains an active medical license as well, serving as a relief staff physician at Bryn Mawr Rehab Hospital here in Paoli, Pennsylvania. And on top of all of that, Keith is a new dad. Thank you again, all of us for joining us. Thank you to Jim and Keith. And now let's turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Annie. And thank you all for being here with us today. There are 850 people signed up for this conference, most of them on this call right now. You come from six continents. We have representation from every continent except Antarctica. You are nonprofit, you are for profit, you are public media, you are newspapers, you are startups, every race, every gender. And we take pride in how inclusive this event is and how inclusive this field is. So thank you, Annie, for your, your remarks. Uh, Keith Leapart wears many hats. He is a medical doctor and a business entrepreneur, uh, specifically in the tech enabled philanthropy space. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time at that. He's operated up and down the philanthropic pyramid from the largest donors being one and appealing to others and all down to the grassroots where his business operates now. He's the past chairman of the Lenfest Foundation. The Lenfest Foundation is distinct from the Lenfest Institute. The foundation was the family's foundation. The Institute is focused on journalism and is the nonprofit owner of the Philadelphia Inquirer. But the foundation was focused on economic empowerment, particularly for Philadelphia's most in need, West Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, et cetera. We're going to talk about what you feel you accomplished there and what your mission was and, and how it informs your current work. Um, Keith serves on the separate boards of the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Lenfest Institute. The Lenfest Institute is the owner, but does not control the Philadelphia Inquirer. Jerry Lenfest wanted to ensure that no donor, no matter how big, even himself, could not control the editorial product of the independent Philadelphia Inquirer, which is very unusual and we think uh, very powerful. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Philanthropy, which is a technology platform whose mission is, and I'm quoting here, to democratize philanthropy, to engage everyday philanthropists, and to engage the long tail donor. We're going to talk about each of those things and what you mean by them. I wanted to just start with your own story, Keith, uh, not going too far back, but just to early adulthood. How did you meet Jerry Lenfest and how did you discover your own passion for philanthropy? Maybe for those folks who don't know him, uh, who was Jerry Lenfest? So Jim, it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to see so many people from all across the world um, on this on this webinar here. Um, as you know, I go way back with uh, Jerry Lenfest. I often describe myself as a physician by training, but an entrepreneur by birth. Uh, I went to medical school and business school. And when I returned back to the Philadelphia area, uh, while in medical school, I started a commercial cleaning company. So I used to clean offices at night. Uh, and just so happened, um, my major account was Suburban Cable. And this was back in 1999, uh, 1998, 1999. And that's where Jerry, and I, Jerry Lindfest and I first connected. And Jerry was an amazing person. 
and he was probably the most important professional influence that I had in my life. He was uh, woke without actually, you know, <laughs> claiming to be woke. He just, he didn't see, he saw individuals. He saw at the time uh, a young black man in his office cleaning his, as he would say, his wastebasket. And he was very curious. And he said to me, hey, sit down. What are you doing in here cleaning my office? Something seems different about you. And, you know, he invited me to sit down in his office. I shared with him at the time I was in medical school and business school that this was a way that I was helping to put myself through school. And at that point, we developed really like a mutual respect for each other and a connection that lasted for many, many years. He went on, of course, to sell his company to uh, Suburban Cable, became one of the original founders of the Giving Pledge. And to we, Comcast. Yes, to Comcast, Comcast, right. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So sell his company to uh, Comcast, become one of the original founders of the Giving Pledge. And we really reconnected. I went on and finished up my residency. We reconnected when... I was considering at the time a run for Congress. Um, and, you know, at the, you, when you're running for public service, you always seek out the people, you know, that can help to support you. And I went to Jerry and I asked him for support. And the thing that struck me, he was, yes, I'll support you. But as I was getting up to leave the office, he said, hey, but I need you to help me to do some things. He said, sit back down. I, I, I would love for you to help me to figure out how I could make a difference uh, in communities uh, of Philadelphia to help people with similar backgrounds to you. And at that point, we were kind of united at the hip on our shared desire to kind of help as many people as we could all the time. Um, you know, I, and I, I, I tell that story because while, you know, Jerry was the type of person who was always there to help. It was, uh, you know, amazing when one day, it was a young man who was at Suburban Cable and his car broke down. It was his first day on the job. It was a Monday uh, evening or, you know, late, probably about six o'clock uh, on a Monday. And his car breaks down and he's in Suburban Cable's parking lot. And the only two people that are out there to help him are myself, who I start pushing his car and Jerry's walking out and he joins me to st start to push, you know, this young man's car. Uh, back into a parking spot and you know jerry just walks off and i go and i tell the guy i said do you know what that is like no i was like that's the ceo of the company so he just a, he just had a, an amazing way to connect with people he was such an influence to so many uh i know he would be so proud of the work that you and annie and the team have done with the lymphatic institute i i think this is beyond his wildest imaginations and dreams of what this could be um you know he never wanted a, a foundation in perpetuity hence why I, the Lymphest Foundation, we wound down our assets and we put them in the market. But I, I know he would be so thrilled uh, of the one, the reputation and on what you all have done to uh, spark, uh, and, uh, you know, journalism and the interest in philanthropy as it relates to journalism in and around the country. So um, I, I salute to all of you and, and for sure, I'm excited to be here. I, I thank you. That means a lot to me personally, as, as you know, uh, take us back to the, to the genesis of the Lenfest Institute. You were there before we were, and you were there at the creation. Uh, what was Jerry trying to do in buying you know, the fire in the first place and then giving it away? You know, so it's, it's a very interesting story of how Jerry got involved even with the Enquirer. And, you know, Jerry was just someone who believed that um, good journalism, one, should be independent, uh, should ne not be controlled by special interests, um, uh, but needed to sustain forever, right? This is something that he thought was core to our democracy. And there was quite a bit of flux at the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, and the Daily News. At the time, the, the paper had had multiple owners over the course of probably you know, a 10 year period or so, it was uh, at the time of disruption in the space, it was rapid disruption, the values of, of newspaper properties and entities were, were, were not ballooning, they were going down. Uh, and there was, in many ways, a bidding war. So the paper was about to be sold. Um, there was a, a bidding war potentially between two parties interested in purchasing the Enquirer. And Jerry was actually just going to be a silent partner. Jerry had no interest uh, in serving on the day-to-day -day role of managing a newspaper. He was supporting his friend and partner in this venture to acquire 
uh, the Inquirer and the Daily News in this bidding process against you know another uh, set of interested parties. And so I remember sitting with with Jerry um, and in his conference room, and it was I think the Monday before uh, the bidding was supposed to take place. It was a, it was going to take place on Wednesday, and I you know I'm asking him, hey, what do you think is going to happen? And you know he was somewhat didn't feel like they were going to win the bid. Not that they couldn't, they could have, you know, they could have decided they had enough money to bid as high as they want. But, you know, they, they I think in some ways he thought there was a threshold that, you know, him and his partner were going to go. Ultimately, that once they came, I think he got really convicted, him and his partner and decided, hey, we need to do this. We don't want this in the wrong hands. And literally just in, he wanted this to be, as I said, totally independent, even his wealth. He didn't want to sway what was happening in the newsroom. He felt like the other parties may not have the same values that he had. And so him and his partner at the time, a great gentleman named Louis Katz, just looked at each other and said, essentially, let's, let's do it. And so they, they had the highest bid. Uh, they end up winning this bid and, you know, we were all excited for Jerry. Um, but, you know, Jerry, once again, was a silent partner, it was just going to be the silent partner. You know, Lewis Katz and, and team were probably going to be more involved in the day to day. And that Saturday, there was a tragic, you know, plane uh, crash up in, in and around Boston area, unfortunately. Uh, and his partner, Lewis Katz, was in the in the plane crash and unfortunately passed away. So Jerry went from being half of this purchase i think it was 88 million that it was purchased at the time jerry's going to put up 44 million to now actually because the you know his partners didn't go to closing yet his partners family i don't think had the same interest in actually you know acquiring this asset as him jerry went from you know spending 44 million to 88 million and now going from what was going to be a silent supporter in the background probably on the board um, you know, as a cheerleader now to having to play an active role. And Jerry was one to seek counsel from, you know, people around him. He was always in, he was, he never felt like he was the smartest person in the room. It was always you on the other side that was the smartest person and that he was really learning from you. So he got some uh, people together to help him think through now, what am I going to do? Jerry was in his eighties, you know, what am I going to do now with this asset? Um, and it took a little while, and he first formed a for-profit board because it was a for-profit entity, uh, and then he came to this board probably a year and a half in and said, hey, I, I have this idea where I want to donate the assets of the Enquirer to a nonprofit. I want to fund this nonprofit to make sure uh, you know, one that the uh, the inquirer has the best chance of survival, but also to support and promote you know journalism, uh, sustainable journalism, uh, you know, throughout the United States. And so, honestly, I was one of the biggest skeptics at the time, and I thought this was the dumbest idea uh, myself. And now the the current uh, chairman of, of the board of the inquirer, because we're thinking this is a for profit you know board. Why do we need this? It's not profit. It's confusing. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and, you know, one day Jerry and I, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Josh and I, uh, the, the chairman of the Enquirer, got called in what I would describe as a principal's office. So Jerry calls us in and says, hey, you guys had the most questions at the board. Meeting. You know, I want you to come in. I'll bring in the attorney who's helping uh, to work on this with me. And you guys ask them all the questions that you want. And, you know, we were skeptics. We went to this meeting. Um, you know, we asked a lot of questions and came out of there a lot less skeptical, but still skeptical. Uh, but by the time we ended up, uh, you know, announcing it and it was formed and the big day, we were like, this is the most brilliant thing that has happened. Right. And, you know, Jerry was always before his time. He was he was running cable wires before we knew what cable television was and, and was kind of betting on that. And he was in his 80s now betting on that there could be a new model uh, for journalism. And it, it is birthed this, right? This has started with something. There were very few um, structures similar to uh, the, the Enquirer uh, Linfest Institute of Journalism structure. And it was something that well, in the beginning was tough to understand. But now seeing the effectiveness of, of, of this model, it's something that you know I'm extremely proud of. And, and I, I hate to say that I was a chief skeptic and now I'm probably the, the chief believer in, in what he's built here. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And I never realized that you were uh, you were a naysayer at the beginning. Oh, I was definitely <laughs> a naysayer. <laughs> certainly glad that uh, 
that he turned you around. Um, I'm just looking at the chat and I commend it to any of you. Uh, we'll have questions um, in, a, in a few minutes, but the Bangor Daily News, the Ithaca Voice, Philadelphia Gay News, Mother Jones, Shelter Force, uh, all over the country, all over the map from a, a, a media and, and, and kind of political perspective. Let's talk about philanthropy with an I. I assume the I is, means I, what can I do? Um, what is the mission and what does the platform do in practical terms? You know, so I always looked at myself. So as you mentioned, I used to chair the board of Linfest Foundation for over 10 plus years. That was my exposure to kind of big philanthropy, right? You know, big checks going out to support great organizations. Uh, but what I realized, one, there were two things that were happening in the sector as a whole. So first, you know, when you look at the data around giving, uh, around 484 billion dollars was given away in 2020 to different charities and despite corporations being great at kind of marketing their philanthropy they probably uh, they are a really small percentage they make up around four percent if you look at every foundation you add up every foundation from the Lenfest foundation to the gates foundation to local community foundations they make up around 19 percent of all giving um the largest part of the pie actually came from individual givers and it was lots of small dollars going to lots of different charities. It's actually very similar to what happens in political giving. And we all know on both sides of the aisle, it is small dollar checks that actually drive up the coffers of, especially on a national level of candidates, right? You know, Obama. Mentioned, oh, you're, you're about to mention the Obama statistic. I thought yeah, I was gonna, you know, so when Obama ran in, in 2012, over 50% and when Obama raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, set records, over 50% of his donations were under $25, right? Over 50%, I'm going to repeat that again, over 50% of his donations were under $25 donations. So he had lots of small donations. The same thing happened on the Republican side with Trump. He had lots of small donations that you know he had big checks but he had a lot of people that were giving and I, I i mentioned the parallels to political giving to philanthropic giving but there's one major difference for uh nonprofit entities versus the political space is that the political space the parties well there's two main parties there are lots of candidates and you know state local and federal but essentially two main parties and they have been able to invest in the data around individual givers, right? And so they may look at Jim and I and say, Jim and Keith are in the same party, forget what party it is, uh, but we're gonna ask Jim, we've done a profile, and we're gonna ask Jim to come to the $25,000 dinner because we know Jim's capacity, and we're gonna ask Keith to give $25, right? They've invested in the data and they know that data. For nonprofits, you know, unfortunately, there are so many different nonprofits and there isn't one central kind of data repository for nonprofits to have a better understanding of who their donors are, who their most likely donors are based on their interest and all the above. And so I looked at this and, and saw and felt like there was a huge opportunity um, to effectively leverage data long term to help nonprofits uh, better connect with their, their givers. Right. And so that was one thought, the, the data side. And then I looked at and also said, but there are also some tools and in the sector that high net worth individuals have access to that I think need to be disrupted a little bit and democratized in that way um, and provide additional exposure. And one of those tools was a tool called a, a donor advised fund. Um, and if you're not familiar with a donor advised fund, just think of it as your, your own personal foundation without an administrative headaches. And if you're on the, I can imagine many of you are familiar with the donor advised fund because you probably also have seen that, you know, one of the criticisms there is that there's a lack of transparency as far as, you know, who the, who the donors are. There's no visibility there. Um, you know, people often, it's been something for high net worth individuals who get the tax deduction in. Uh, get the tax deduction by putting money in, but you know they're not as aggressive with getting dollars off the charities, which is a big criticism. And you know, for me, it was about how can we one open this up as a tool. How can we leverage, uh, you know, partners that are interested in empowering one their employees to uh, support charities. So we launched as a workplace giving platform where employers were able to set up what we call an impact account for their employees 
one CEO described it like a 401k, but for philanthropy, where an employer put fun, puts funds into the uh, Jim Freelick family fund. Uh, and if you put you know, $100 in, you could match that dollars. It's not a taxable benefit to you. It's a tax deduction for the employees. And then you direct it out to the charities. And it was a, a allowing you know, the employers to, instead of having top-down philanthropy, allow bottoms-up philanthropy within the organization, right? To get their people involved in a meaningful way, allow them to support the charities that were important to them. And we saw great success with that. Employers are doing two-to-one matches, four-to-one matches. You can imagine the engagement that happens there, and then we share the data out. And so that was the, the starting point. And then it evolved when we realized that there was also great interest from financial service partners. So philanthropy and big, you know, philanthropy with a Y is everywhere. I mean, we've all been at the checkout where you've been asked to round up to a random charity and all of us, you know, probably care about different charities. And we're, the thought was, you know, when you're rounding up at the checkout, um, one, there's no attribution. They don't know who those dollars came from. Two, typically it actually, when the check goes out, it comes from, you know, the, the retailer that's administering the check not quite personal and we talked about how could we personalize that experience and do it with a card partner and and so uh, just over the last uh you know six months we have uh, announced and started a partnership with american express where american express card members um can connect their cards to an impact account can round up into the key fleet part family fund and then direct those dollars out to you know the charity of their choice whether that's the Linfest Institute for Journalism or you know local nonprofit and so it was a way to kind of personalize that experience and democratization to me is about giving more people a seat at the table giving more people the ability to direct dollars directly to causes that are important uh to to them and honestly to sustain you know, when you get specifically to journalism, to sustain journalism in the long term, it's going to require democratization. It's going to require more people given. But I also believe that it will require, um, you know, government to think differently about the value of journalism. Right? We all know that there's been an attack on journalism, and and I believe that we should, you know, structure any and almost like incentivize people to support. Uh, uh, you know, journalism in a sense where if you if you're a subscriber or you make a, of course, a contribution to a nonprofit, it's, it should be considered tax deductible, right? Like that is a way that I think would incentivize uh, people in that space. And I think it's one of the things that can happen um, with a legislative intervention for sure. Thank you. I, as I think you know, the, the Local Journalism Sustainability Act was designed to do exactly that. And it got within one vote of passing in the United States Senate, and it will be back. Um, I, I I wanted to just give a use case, which is which is me. I have an American Express card. I am enabled on philanthropy. Uh, I've set up, in effect, a private DAF, um, courtesy of philanthropy and, and American Express. I've instructed it to round up to the nearest five dollars each time I charge a meal or a drink. You can choose the category, it's dining, it's travel, it's all of my transactions. You can choose the amount, round up to the nearest dollar, round up to the nearest $5, round up to the nearest $10. You can direct to a bundle of charities or you can direct to a single charity. So it turns everyone into a philanthropist and it does so in micro transactions that wind up really adding up quite a lot. And I think you should be extraordinarily proud of how it works and how seamless and frictionless it is. Well, um, and I am, John, I'm extremely proud, but I, I do want to say, you know, the reality is, is that philanthropy, big philanthropy can somewhat be disempowering to all of us as individual givers, right? Like there is this, you know, it has to be a balance where you hear about larger checks going to different organizations organizations or to all of our organizations. Um, and if I am a, uh, you know, an individual giver and I can't write a six-figure check or a seven-figure check or a five-figure check, how do we still create the, the value, right? How do, how do I still feel valued as a giver that's given that $25 or $50, right? And I think there is something that we, we have been trying to accomplish with 
um, our platform, which will actually let, allows you to see the cumulative impact of your philanthropy over time. So if I look at, you know, my last year's philanthropic giving, it's it's one thing, right? What I did in 2021, but when I'm able to look at it like a portfolio of giving over the course of the last five years, it's way more significant. You can see how my philanthropy has evolved. You can see how it's grown. You can see how my interests have changed. And I think that's one of the things that psychologically we want to make sure that the individual giver, which is really, really important, Right, this individual giver, really, really important, the long-tail donor, that they feel valued here for sure. So there's there's a fairly easy path to onboarding people onto your platform. There are other platforms that, that do similar things at the company level, if not the individual level. So the, the use case here, the opportunity for news philanthropists on this call is to supercharge your individual grassroots giving in a seamless and easy and very trackable way. I assume you receive data about the, as, as a user of this, you receive data in general terms, not necessarily specific terms, or rather that an individual charity knows who's giving to them, obviously, but their data are not shared with the rest of the network. Is that correct? Right. It is. We don't share the data with the rest of the network, but we do, you know, the charity knows who make the contribution to them. So I'm just reading from the chat here. There's Marsha Parker from the New York Times. Yes, the New York Times is appealing for philanthropic support for some of its solutions journalism, including from the Ford Foundation and others. Um, Rusty Coates is commenting about um, incentivizing individual giving as Keith's platform and others do. Uh, David Clinch about the vital importance of the data side and leveraging big data for uh, for the purpose of local news. There's chat and greetings from Ricochet Media in Canada, from Washington, D.C., from Civic Stories in New Jersey, from Olympia, Washington, Santa Fe, New Mexico, NPR in Oregon, the 19th News, uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, where we would like to have this conference next year next year uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh report for america which has put thousands of reporters on the streets uh, mainly with individual gifts uh local gifts matched by um national gifts uh, annenberg uh, from penn uh, cuny journalism school supported by craig newmark a major philanthropist here in new york city and uh, uh, the west mountain tribune from colorado and many, many more. I just got a new one from Edmond, Washington, north of Seattle. Um, so very exciting to be talking to everyone about this new world. I want to shift gears to the buy side, um, meaning big philanthropy. You were the chairman of a well-funded foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how can big philanthropy do a better job um, you've said in our pre-call, you've seen the good and seen the bad in institutional giving. Uh, what do you mean by that? So, as I mentioned, the, the the good side is that you get a nice size check, right? And I understand the the pain of any nonprofit fundraising executive of of having to spend time cultivating relationships when you, you're, you're short staff, right? And so the model makes sense right now, where um, if I'm going to sit down and, you know, pitch my organization, I'm probably going like any other business, you're probably going to want to go after someone who can write the biggest check, right? And so that's been the consistent model. But we've talked about the fact that that has left the, the long tail donor in many ways untapped. It's just like, you know, free money. They have to find you because you don't have the time to directly engage with them. And then there's also big philanthropy that, you know, just psychologically, I, 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 you get the sense that people don't feel like their dollars matter. So what could big philanthropy do? And I think it's one of the things that Jerry did extremely well. And even the foundation of the Linfest Institute was based upon a principle of matching dollars, right? Like he was, I'm going to put up some coffers, but I need for you, Jim, and you, Annie, to unlock this, you got to go out and find others who are supporting me on this journey and I'll match their dollars in, right? That can happen both at, you know, a five-figure check, a six-figure check, but also at the individual level. And it's great that organizations, I believe you mentioned like News Philanthropy are, are, are doing stuff like that. I think that has to be consistent across the board. 
I think it has to be something that I think will that will continue to accelerate because I'm very optimistic that we're going to get uh, that bill over the finish line. Um, you know, and and if not, you know, this this Congress, some some you know, within the next five years, I would say that has to be the law of the land because I think that will be one of the things um, that will help us as individuals feel more empowered to tap in, right? Because we're going to get you know one some. Uh, recognition or some credit like this is too important for society like journalism is too important for society and it has to be balanced you know it has to be balanced journalism as as journalists and as you know media outlets we have to be ba balanced we all have our own perspective as individuals um but when we present the the the, the news it has to be feel feel balanced and feel like it's presenting, you know, all sides of the argument, right? Because it's probably more than two sides of any argument uh, in, in the world that we live in here. But it has to be civil as well. When you talked about the good and the bad of big philanthropy, uh, I, I sense that where you were headed was that philanthropy can perpetuate either existing power structures or existing systemic issues and obviously not every major philanthropy is run by a self-made black Philadelphian. How well, how do you think philanthropy can do a better job at driving real change? So in some ways it's staying out the way, right? So the the, the challenge could be so every philanthropist doesn't have the approach of, of Jerry Lentfest where, hey, I'm gonna put my money, invest in people who I believe in Put the structures in place and allow them to operate. I'm not going to try to sway, uh, you know, public opinion using philanthropy. And there is a, there is, we are at risk of that as well. We can't be naive and say that big dollars, whether it's in, you know, in philanthropy or in politics, can't sway public discourse or can't sway public opinion. And so, you know, to be, we have to keep ourselves. Big philanthropy has to keep themselves honest around their intent and in getting involved in journalism. Right. Everyone, I'm not naive, everyone doesn't have the mindset of Jerry. And we have to, we we also, as receivers of those funds, we also have to say, hey, this is probably not something we want to take on if we feel like we're getting pushed in a direction that we're uncomfortable with or isn't consistent with um, you know, um, you know, journalistic principles that we we all The, at the on the board of the Enquirer perspective, it is very clear <laughs> that the board has no, you know, no influence at all on the content that comes in the Enquirer, right? Good, bad, or indifferent, but the board from that perspective, it is hands-off relationship, you, you know, and, and if you even thought about it, you were getting smacked at the board level, right? And so, we have to have to make sure that it's consistent also with philanthropy because we if philanthropy may want to fund certain things certain types of coverage but shouldn't dictate the coverage there and that's where i think the, the bad side could be there for sure to be clear the your board and our board advocate for and our board approves funding for diversity in the newsroom coverage of racial justice digital transformation and um an array of of investigative news activities around gun violence and public safety, um, asbestos in public schools, these kinds of things. What we don't do is dictate news coverage. No. We're able to put our thumb on the scale with regard to what's important, but that's pre-agreed as a part of the mission. I'm just checking the chat again. Um, Cardinal News in Virginia, Mercer Me in Mercer County, New Jersey, the Springfield Daily Citizen from Springfield, Missouri, uh, the, the Prison Journalism Project, uh, Dow Jones News Fund, which is my alma mater and several of my colleagues. Uh, Dow Jones is the owner of the Wall Street Journal. Um, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, the, among the leading uh, sources of news about philanthropy, uh, hearing, hearing your story, Keith, uh, Media Bridge Partners, uh, um, Shannon Bowen, my friend from the North Carolina local news workshop, Radar Media, which covers anti-racism and promotes anti-racism in, in rural Canada. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts about how philanthropy can help drive racial justice. Um, mm. What is the role of a funder in saying, 
you should do this or you shouldn't do that? Are we to support people we think have their hearts and minds in the right place or encourage and and um, incentivize them to to be more equitable. That's so fun it's fun of journalism and coverage. You, you can probably, you know, you probably won't be surprised, but I think diversity in the newsroom is is super, super critical, right? Um, diversity of opinions, diversity of thoughts, diversity of colors, diversity of of you know uh, sexual preferences. All those things are are really important in in, in a newsroom or in any organization. Um, the challenge, of course, and, and the opportunity for philanthropy is when um, an organization may come up with an excuse of why they can't um, create more diversity, and you pick whatever uh, piece of diversity you want to want to focus on, why they can't achieve certain goals. Philanthropy has an opportunity to help provide uh, the support and infrastructure to make that happen, right? Like there was, there we all know that at some point there sometimes a race for talent, and so how can philanthropy, uh, you know, incentivize those good behaviors? And I think that is one of the things that, in full transparency, the Lymphatic Institute has been extremely helpful with, even with the inquiry, right? There is the goodwill and the intent of all people on the, um, you know, on the on the board side to make it happen, but operationally, like the the board is always looking at, you know, you gotta have to, and I'm talking about the inquiry board. Look at the bottom line of the business, right? Like there is, you know, are we are, you know, where's our advertising, at, right? Like how do we handle last mile? All those different things, and so you know, from a board perspective, sometimes diversity can be one of the many things that need to happen, but you know, uh, may lose prioritization. And I think what the what the uh, the institute has been really helpful in is helping to prioritize that within the organization um, and providing resources when appropriate and when thoughtful to help stimulate that. Right, like in in, in creating pipelines for interns, creating uh, programs for, for additional training for us staff to kind of upskill there. Those are the things that I've seen effective specifically with the Lymphatic Institute of Journalism. And I think that is something that philanthropy can do. We will not, when you go specifically to, um, you know, what, what is happening with um, social justice and some of those inequalities there, like we, we, we need to make sure that there is, uh, that people are giving a voice, right? Like when it comes... I was talking to a friend last night and could be as different from, you know, respectfully Donald Trump as anyone in the world. Totally different. Um, he was a friend, grew up in the neighborhood with, he was a barber, um, who when he looked and said, you know, I started to believe Trump that there was fake news, right? And and we all know that Trump was very effective of calling out uh, or or highlighting potential biases within journalism. So you know, and and when you have someone who's totally opposite of Trump, right? With you know, not wouldn't be a Trump supporter, but when he said I connected with Trump around fake news, that should be alarming uh, to us as you know, as one uh, a community. And then how does uh, philanthropy? How can we promote and make sure that that one that the coverage is equitable, that the, the sources are equitable, that the voices are equitable in, in journalism, because if not, we're going to turn off, you know, some of the people that we think we're we're, we're trying to speak to. Um, and it's a hard job. And, you know, I'm blessed to have lots of different friends from different backgrounds. And, and, and one of my uh, you know, uh, good friends also sent me a, he's, a, you know, this was uh, the, the gentleman that I was initially talking about was a young black barber who I grew up in with the neighborhood. Another friend sent me another note because he knows I'm on the board of the Empire, a very scathing note. And he is a, an Italian American who lives in Jersey, who, you know, um, who, who, who sent me a note and said that the coverage of the local media is like, they think we are so dumb that they have to tell us how to think, right? So how can we make sure? And he was he was scathing. He said, I have to say, like, I feel like, you know, he's criticizing a property that I'm on the board of the inquiry and saying, I feel like they're telling us how to think versus presenting the information and making sure that we're smart enough to make a decision. And, and so we have to balance. That. And I told him, I said, I think that's really good feedback. We're starting to get quite a lot of questions in the uh, in the Q&A, and I'm going to give 
my colleague Yossi Lichterman kind of one minute warning that I appreciate him jumping on. He's already there. Um, uh, I'll start with a couple of questions that uh, I can see in the chat and then have, uh, have Yossi jump in. Uh, Keith, you've got a new customer, David Grant, who is a former Facebook executive from the Facebook Journalism Project, who uh, did the world a whole lot of good in that role, uh, is now with a group called Blue Engine, which advises newsrooms on, on their evolution. Um, he said he signed up for philanthropy and uh, he found a local newsroom that he supports, which is Scalawag. So um, uh, good on you, David. Um, there's a question from Diane Sylvester about how we can encourage philanthropists to think about equity in giving to their newsrooms. I, I think you, you just did quite a good job on that. Um, uh, uh, De La Pena Andreas, uh, is asking big philanthropies sometimes connect small givers with large grant seekers. Why is it so hard, however, to connect small givers with small grant seekers? The, mm -hmm. These platforms often um, say, if you want to give to United Way or you want to give to uh, the, the American Cancer Society or Planned Parenthood, click here. Uh, the, the marketplace between small and small seems uh, more challenging. Can you address that? And then we'll turn to Yossi to ask more questions. Yeah. So it, one, it's one of the, the biggest challenges and one of the things that we're trying to do, right? So you think about it. And so we often, as our feature tribes, try to highlight, you know, smaller organizations, more local organizations, ones that are not, you know, the American Red Cross or the American Cancer Society or Susan G. Komen, right? So that is one of our main focuses. But I think the key is actually going to be long-term around data. Right. Our goal is to build kind of a two sided marketplace where charities can actually communicate and directly connect with uh, donors within our platform. Right. We but that's a journey when you're building out a product. And David, you asked a question of, of how we you know, when does that occur? That's clearly on, on, on our product roadmap. My, my vision always is, was to build kind of LinkedIn, but for philanthropy, right, where um, us as individuals can see what our you know, our friends are interested in and in supporting. Uh, but also allow, you know, the the uh, nonprofits to directly c connect and engage and thank people for contributions in real time, right? If I am making a, a, a contribution to the Linfest Institute of Journalism, you know, why can't the Linfest In Institute of Journalism kind of like my grant out, you know, in real time, like we do anything else? And so that is where we're going on a product roadmap perspective. And one of those goals, we believe one of the things that will happen is that yes, democratization will occur where smaller organizations will have better access to, um, you know, be able to better prioritize, you know, how they're leveraging technology to connect with individuals that may have an interest in their organization based on their patterns and behaviors um, and, and the philanthropic space. So the, the short answer is tech enablement helps yes. the, the small donor and the small donor, donor seeking are the small grantees seeking uh, support just as it did Barack Obama and, and Donald Trump, actually. Absolutely. Um, uh, Yossi, what, what else is in the, uh, in the Q&A? Let me okay. unmute myself. Uh, sorry about that. Um, another question is from Marsha Parker. Um, there are so many local news organizations here, and Keith, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to leverage the platform to flag donors and bring new, new donors in, is there a way to identify and connect with local donors specifically? So if I'm in Philadelphia, I can give to local Philadelphia organizations, for example. Yeah, so what you're focusing on is, is really what we call geolocating, right? Like, you know, if you come into the platform um, based upon your location, you be able to see a bunch of local organizations. So in our platform, you can search, you know, for all, if I just put in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I can see, every nonprofit that is, you know, 501c that's in there. And if I want to say in a certain, you know, field of interest, if I said news, it would then filter down, right? And so there is the ability to uh, search for those. We will continue to add features like, you know, if you select a certain area and you only want to see stuff in the arts or you only want to see, you know, uh, only interest in the news space, you'll start to see those as kind of feature charities on your dashboard. So um, it is part of, the the product development life cycle and and one of the things that we're 
you know, it's on our roadmap, but we're prioritizing now. Right now, I think the big opportunity is for all of you who have an audience. If you, if they're uh, Amex users, for sure, they can easily link their card, can begin to round up to uh, their organ, round up into their account, and then select your organization. You know, if it's a nonprofit organization that's in our platform, uh, and over we have over 1.1 million charities. So if you're in good standing, you're in GuideStar. We have a partnership with Candid and GuideStar. If you're there. It's going to show up and then they can set up a recurring contribution when it gets to a certain amount uh, to your organization. So you're not exclusive to American Express, right? That they are your first major partner. So our first major partner, so that it's Roundup enabled through American Express. We're talking to others about uh, being able to do that as well. You can also set up and re you can fund your account with a credit card or directly through ACH. But, you know, the partnership with American Express is just your spending habits actually help you accumulate, right? So just by spending, the change goes into your account. You can also just directly fund your account and then direct those dollars um, to an organization. So we we talked before early on about with our with our employer partners, it's connected to payroll. So people are you know putting dollars in uh, connected to their pay cycle. Employers are matching, and then of course those uh, dollars have been directed to you know one or multiple organizations. I'm assuming you you have the capacity to kind of hold or the customer service to take people by the hand and show them how to use the platform and um, to not have to bring on a big data person themselves and so forth. No, 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 no. It, it's all self-service and self-managed and the ability to connect with us that, you know, you can imagine we had to build up that that part of it to support uh, onboarding Amex customers for sure. You'll see, I'll, I'll ask the next question and then you can search for the following. Sachi Kobayashi is citing uh, data and information from the Lilly School of Philanthropy, Keith, that consistently shows that younger people and people of color are more likely to give, but many fundraisers still overlook them. What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> if you agree, how can we yeah, work? I, I say this all the time, and I think it often gets ignored. <laughs> um, you know, the most active givers right now are millennial and Gen Z, right? So millennials and Gen Z are the most active givers. Eight out of 10 millennials gave to charity. The second most active group is Gen Z, and that's that 18 to 25 year old group you know, 66% of them gave to a charity. And it's not that they have most money, but their values are around making a difference and making an impact. But they're often the ones, uh, as you pointed out, that are often overlooked, right? And so how do we bridge that gap? And then also you look at communities of colors, it, it, it is very interesting and shocking that as a percentage of, you know, wealth and everything else, African-Americans give the highest percentage of their dollars out to charities, right? To organizations that they need to support. And this is where I was talking about philanthropy. Big philanthropy is very disempowering because you would never know this. You would only think of these Jerry Linfests of the world or uber wealthy people as, as participants in what is something that everyone, you know, or, or over 50% of, of Americans are participating in. And, and I think by you know, encouraging and highlighting the visibility and the importance of these individual contributions, I think we can get those numbers up. But the good news around society, no matter what you say about millennials or Gen Z, they actually are the people that care about what is happening in this world. And they're doing it with their actions. They're giving, they're not waiting. The, this, you know, philanthropy used to be more of a destination, meaning Keith has to sell a company, then he gets involved. Now for young people, it's a journey. They give them where they are now, They'll continue to evolve. They'll continue to give more and more. And as they, you know, progress in their careers, as they gain more access to capital, we hope those patterns continue and that they continue to give more and more. And I think society will be in a much better shape, right? They're giving, they're, the percentage of them that give is significantly greater than their parents and grandparents. And you ask, why is that? That's, that's really encouraging. More questions from my millennial friend, Yossi. Um, yes. Um, one last question, then I think we'll we'll wrap it up. And um, but a question here from Dick Tofel. Keith would love to hear your reaction to the shutdown of Amazon Smile. Isn't this exactly the type of thing we need more of, not less? It, it, it's sad um, when we looked at that. That this was, you know, sad, but not necessarily shocking. That Amazon Smile wasn't necessarily about the nonprofits. It was from what people have. You know, document it seemed to be more of a of a of a marketing play to get people on to you know uh, get people on Amazon to set up 
so continue to use the site right and you when things i guess got tough internally it's something that the organization has seemed to build on and it, it really is not some you know amazon should be ashamed of itself to be quite honest right it's it is something that is needed more now and they they are in position uh to you know to keep that program alive if they really were interested and i'm actually excited about what i'm seeing at, at companies like paypal which you know are now getting into the grants payment space they're allowing you to you know make contributions to things like you know venmo like so there are some companies out there that get it they're investing in it um but amazon is one of the largest companies in the world i think it's shameful that at this moment where um these organizations need the most and actually you think about the nonprofits really help build amazon amazon and amazon smile by saying hey you know find us on here connect with us and then for them to kind of bag that program i'm i'm saddened by it but not necessarily surprised by it for everyone on the call if you have not read dick topol's second draft um newsletter last week it's about mackenzie scott's um extraordinary giving um she the former wife of, um, of uh, the, uh, the Amazon CEO and founder. Uh, yes, you time for more questions or do we need to move to uh, the next session? Um, I, we are just out of time, so we're going to wrap things up. But um, thank you, Jim and, and Keith. This was a remarkable session and a great way to start the summit. Um, I know there's um, a lot more probably we could talk about, so Keith will have to invite you back to answer some of the questions we couldn't get to, including an invitation from Candace Fortman to come to Detroit, which um, so we'll uh, have to follow up on that. Um, we are um, wrapping up this session. We'll be back at the bottom of the hour, so 12.30 Eastern time for our next sessions, which are um, a conversation with the team from Searchlight New Mexico, who will lead a workshop on how to create generative relationships with major donors. And leaders from Santa Cruz local, local in the Haitian Times will join my Lenfest and Stu colleagues for a candid conversation on everything you need to know about fiscal sponsorships. Um, you can join both from the Zoom lobby, and I hope you'll hang out there in the meantime and continue to chat with folks and check out um, what we have coming up. So thank you for all the lovely comments in the chat. Um, Yossi, in in sixty seconds. Uh, what are you what are you most excited about or or perhaps what are some of the things that people should not miss between now and um in the middle of the day tomorrow uh, oh man um i am biased i think they're all terrific but um i'm looking forward we have a conversation um with the folks from the baltimore beat which i'm biased toward because i live here in baltimore on how they um have uh started to build relationships with donors and um what their approach to philanthropy is so that's this afternoon and i think will be terrific and um tomorrow afternoon we have our closing keynote with dick tofel speaking with um terry quinn and sewell chan from the texas tribune about how to build successful relationships with um between the fundraising team and the newsroom which will be terrific so last 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 um the theme of this conference is transformation meaning how do you transform your news organizations into uh, very well-supported philanthropies. Um, how do we transform philanthropy itself into a much more democratized, equitable, and powerful, and larger field serving news? Um, Keith has been a transformational character in all these respects and a transformational presence in my life, um, a great partner. So thank you, Keith Leapart, for everything you do and everything you are. Thank you.